axial airway, we measure from the nostril to the tragus of the ear and select an appropriate diameter for the patient's nostril. Risks associated with head injuries are significantly overstated. Just be careful. If you meet resistance, stop. The key point is to be gentle in the ins with the insertion of these airways and you're unlikely to do any significant damage. In terms of the insertion of a nasal airway, you need to size the airway. You need to lubri lubricate it with KY lubricant and select the nostril which appears the biggest. Slowly slide the airway in. Aim for the back of the patient's head. It is common for a little re resistance just inside the nostril. Gently rolling the tube from side to side while continue to continuing to gently push will use or usually overcome this. But never force the airway. If you meet significant resistance, stop and try the other nostril. Small amounts of bleeding when you insert a nasal airway are very, very common and are nothing to be concerned about. Some patients end up with what we refer to as the hedgehog look. If you are really struggling, there is no shame in having an oral airway, two nasal airways and doing two-person jaw thrust and hand ventilation if that is what is required to maintain the airway and ventilate the patient. Don't feel that you need to be bound to using just a single oral airway or a single nasal airway. Suctioning the airways are overrated and overused. Only suction the airway if it appears grossly contaminated and it's interfering with ventilation. Generally do not suction pulmonary edema fluid or blood unless there's significant interference. We'll now talk a little bit about laryngeal mask airways. We've now introduced the full size range of LMAs. I have some specific comments just about a couple of the sizes first. With the size of the newborns and infants, we recommend that this is used in preference to intubation wherever possible. It's safer and has been consistently demonstrated to be more reliable than attempting to intubate small children and newborns. Secondly is a comment about the size 5 LMA. This is the large adult size. It looks disturbingly large, but it is the right size for anyone over 90 to 100 kilos, and that's the size to use in these patients. If you use a smaller size, you'll have a lot more problems with leak and difficulty in ventilation. So despite its disturbing appearance, it's appropriate for large people. Generally speaking, within St John, LMAs appear to be performing well. There is still some resistance at AP level. While endotracheal intubation remains the gold standard, it's not without problems and it isn't always the best option. So if an LMA is in place and the patient is ventilating and oxygenating well, and there is no need to change it over to an endotracheal tube in the field. And we are discouraging this practice. On a practical note, we know that the packaging is bulky, but do not open them or store them out of their packaging until they are required. There's two main reasons. One is that while they don't have to be sterile, they do need to be clinically clean. And clinically clean is a higher standard than just clean. We don't want dirt or dust on them. That causes irritation to the airway and can predispose to infection. Secondly, when out of the packaging they damage easily and lose their shape, especially the cuff. Despite appearing relatively robust, small holes are common and this can significantly interfere with ventilating the patient. In terms of their insertion, you need to select the appropriate size for the patient and then select an appropriate size syringe for the LMA. The syringe attachment on the LMA will have the volume of air required to inflate it. Complete, completely deflate the cuff, lubricate the anterior and posterior surfaces of the tip of the mask with KY lubricant, place the head in a neutral position and open the mouth. Grasp the LMA, the opening should be facing towards the patient's tongue. Hold the jaw while pushing the LMA backwards round the curve of the tongue. Maintain backwards downwards pressure until resistance is felt. Inflate the cuff, attach a self-inflating bag and ventilate the patient looking to see that there is symmetrical chest movement. Once you're happy with the position and that the patient is ventilating on the LMA, secure the tube with a tie, tape or a Thomas tube holder. If the patient starts coughing or gagging, stop and remove the LMA. If you are having problems inserting the LMA, consider lifting the jaw further forward placing two fingers on the back of the cuff of the mask and using these to push the mask round the curve of the tongue 
and occasionally consider if it's a problem with insufficient lubrication. This isn't common, but sometimes a little bit more KY on the back of the, back of the mask may be sufficient to ease insertion. Once you've optimised the airway position and used airway adjuncts if appropriate, you need to consider if you need to hand ventilate the patient. This is the use of a self-inflating bag to ventilate them. It can be via a face mask or via the LMA. It's usually too fast. Whenever we look at staff members ventilating patients, almost universally they're ventilating too fast. Slow down. Think about each breath rather than just blindly squeezing the bag. The approximate rates for adults are 8 to 10 breaths per minute. If you squeeze the bag and then in your mind say, release, 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 and then squeeze the bag again. For children the rate is faster, 16 to 20 breaths per minute. So again, squeeze the bag, but think release, release. So this time only two releases between squeezes. And if asthma is the primary problem, then six breaths per minute is what we aim for. Use your watch and do not focus on end tidal CO2, just six breaths per minute. Hand ventilation by mask can be a tricky skill to develop and maintain. There is value to even experienced members practicing this skill. If you are struggling, then you should undertake the jaw thrust and hold the mask on the face, and if assisted or hand ventilation is required, get a second person to squeeze the bag. Assisted ventilation is hand ventilating someone who is breathing spontaneously. Again, it's overrated and it's overused. If a patient has adequate oxygenation, generally resist the temptation to assist with ventilation. It's not without risk, it's uncomfortable for the patient, can cause vomiting and lead to aspiration. In the spontaneously breathing patient, you frequently fight with the patient and cause significant gastric distension. If oxygenation is poor, it's okay. Consider calling for an RSI qualified AP or doctor in this circumstance. With the current procedures update, we are introducing positive end expiratory pressure valves, or PEEP valves, as an attachment to our self-inflating bags. What these valves do is cause the patient to exhale against resistance, added into the self-inflating bag circuit with a controllable valve. This delays alveoli and small airway collapse, which occurs during exhalation, and increases the amount of working lung surface available for gas exchange. It improves both oxygenation and ventilation. Currently, it's suitable only for adults, and we've introduced it for anyone over 50 kilos, which corresponds roughly with puberty. PEEP is indicated for acute pulmonary edema, asthma or cord, although remember that a bag mask only goes on to an asthmatic patient when they're at the point of needing their breathing assisted to maintain oxygenation. And a slow rate must be maintained, of six breaths per minute. It's indicated for ventilated patients, can be used for any patient who is being ventilated via an endotracheal tube. It's contraindicated in patients with traumatic brain injury. PEEP can cause significant rises in intracranial pressure. However, there is an exception for this, to this for our RSI trained APs and it is covered separately in their procedure. It can be used on a bag mask, an LMA or an endotracheal tube. It's initially set at 10 centimetres of water. It has a range of setting options from 5 to 20 centimetres of water. However, it's generally considered there is limited benefit below 10. So we've set 10 as our starting point. It's a requisite that the patient is status 1 and not improving. It's also important that all members are familiar with the equipment required for intubation, as you may be required to assist an advanced paramedic or a doctor with this procedure. You should be able to identify a laryngoscope and blades, endotracheal tubes, a tube introducer, a bougie, and the capnography connections for a LifePak 12 or MRX. You should follow the directions of the member you are assisting with the intubation. You may be asked to pass equipment, stabilise the neck, apply anterior laryngeal pressure, or hook out the side of the patient's lips. The officer you are assisting will tell you exactly what you need